Chapter 10, Reflections on God and Religion in the book Common Sense Renewed. Atheism has been made the official religion of Russia and other communist nations. In part, this has been due to concepts which have become an essential part of religious doctrine in many of the world's established religions. Yet religious teachings are subject to evolution as they interact with expanding knowledge in other fields. No one can foretell the precise nature of the concepts which will characterize Christianity and other religious faiths 1,000 or even 100 years hence. It would be helpful in bridging the chasm which now separates the philosophical foundations of the United States and Russia if we could reinterpret our religious tenets in a manner which would appeal to self-proclaimed atheists. I present here certain reflections of a personal nature which seek to reach those minds. If they offend readers who hold to more traditional views, I hasten to note that I am only a private citizen and do not attempt to alter the convictions of those who sincerely hold contrary beliefs. A human being is composed of perhaps 60 trillion cells, all working together to maintain a collective existence in this hostile world. Each of those cells, viewed alone, is a living miracle, a manifestation of vast intelligence and eternal energy. Our bodies combine many organs and tissues, including specialized components capable of reproducing our species in an endless succession of increasing verity. How matter begins the continuing phenomenon of life is beyond our understanding. We observe with wonder those features of living things which can be projected into our limited sphere of knowledge. Life appears to be an intrinsic potential of all matter, requiring precise circumstances to bring it into being. We are bewildered by the marvels of the human brain, which combines perhaps one trillion interconnected cells and a central control mechanism for the body as a whole, receiving information from the environment, processing, reviewing, and storing it, and using it to guide its sheltering body through a brief existence here on Earth. We cannot know whether each of the multitudes of brain cells is aware of its own existence. We do perceive that all of them, working collectively, give rise to our individual awareness and to our thoughts, feelings, and purposeful actions. We observe that each nerve cell or neuron is an entity unto itself, with filamentous projections which lead to other cells in the nervous system and throughout the body. Each neuron and somatic cell plays a special role in the concerted activities which give rise to our individual identities. If each cell is self-aware in some miniature manner, it is unlikely to be capable of recognizing its subsidiary role in the body as a whole. We now understand that every living cell is an extremely complicated chemical factory. Each one is made of millions of component molecules, some small and others large and intricate. Certain of the larger protein molecules combine thousands of atoms in precise arrangements. All are suspended in a watery medium which permits the continuous motions and chemical interactions which together make up the dynamic equilibrium we recognize as life. Life is chemistry. It is a manifestation of potentials universally present in matter and energy. The coordinated reactions contained within the delicate membranes of each cell continue an ongoing struggle to maintain its integrity in opposition to contrary natural forces which appear to impel all things relentlessly toward disintegration and decay. The trial of life on this planet can be traced backward in time for more than two billion years. The general pattern manifests a trend toward increasing complexity with continuous adaptation to changing environmental conditions. There is evidence that all living earthly things have derived from a single beginning, although it is possible that the spark of life may have been struck on several occasions, each time establishing simple beginnings from which similar sequential changes have evolved to manifest life forces until then dormant and hidden. Once in motion, the miracle of life has continued to unfold the increasingly variegated display of plants, animals, and microscopic forms now known to us. We observe the process of growth and differentiation advancing even now, creating new forms and adaptations within the mantle of living things. Dissection of a cell beyond the molecular level reveals its elemental atomic components. We have learned that each atom resembles a miniature solar system with planetary electrons whirling eternally in orbital patterns around a central nucleus. 
In a limited way, we understand some of the smaller structural features of the atomic world. We visualize electrons, protons, neutrons, and many other substructures of diminishing size and substance. Today it appears that the ultimate building blocks may be entities labeled quarks. These together with their energy equivalents make up what we perceive as reality. But we know that our perceptions are illusionary, and that what seems solid is mainly empty space sparsely occupied by ghost-like foci of energy which are continuing even now, an endless frenzied dance which began with the birth of this universe, and which may have undergone transcendental changes and a pathway which extended back beyond time. When we attempt to understand reality beyond our present impressions, we are groping in realms and shadows which are beyond our ken. Every moment of our lives, chemical processes are interchanging and replacing atoms, molecules, and complete cells within us. Although the general design and identity of our bodies remain relatively constant, the building blocks which comprise us are undergoing continuous rearrangement. Atoms now a part of one cell may in a few moments be part of another. Matter present in a human being today has been in existence for billions of years. Perhaps it was once interstellar dust, then it became part of our Earth condensed into solidity through our solar system's birth. Yesterday it may have been part of a plant or a farm animal. Today it is a human, giving rise to thought or action. Tomorrow it will again be dust. In the course of time, it may undergo a series of deaths and reincarnations in the organic mantle of this planet. We recognize in moments of introspection that our realities are illusions fashioned by our senses and cognitive function. They are rooted in eternal constants which we can never fully understand. Each quark, electron, proton, atom, and molecule is a manifestation of the Almighty. Our natures, thoughts, and actions are expressions of an eternal essence, reflecting for an instant the light of an infinite and eternal being as the plane of the present sweeps down the endless dimension of time. Each atom, molecule, and cell within us contributes to our identity and awareness. Our joys, pains, and strivings may embody turmoils existing eternally in the soul of the Supreme Being, the summation of all existence. Perhaps we are like cells in the mind of God, contributing to celestial functions beyond our ken, just as our own cells unknowingly fashion our thoughts and actions. Perhaps the laws of nature order and constrain even the living and eternal deity from which they sprang and of which they are a part. Conflict and suffering may be eternally a part of the divine plan, except that they can be resolved and eased by forces for good, working through us and other agencies. In our brief life, each of us has a precious moment in which to exert our energies for good or evil. After death, we may return to the infinite whole from which we sprang, as a raindrop returns to the sea. We and all things are parts of the eternal reality. All pathways lead finally to God, and are closed circles in and of God. It may have been in this sense that Christ said, Before Abraham was born, I am. His life manifested in a perfect manner divine qualities which are imperfectly expressed in all of us. Mary, his human mother, played a unique role as the agency which made him man. Christians believe that the divine nature of Christ remains with us, and that it is in some mysterious manner present in the physical form of the Eucharist. Throughout human history, religion has worn many costumes and played many roles. In an earlier age, it was rooted in superstition and fanciful speculation, just as were our understandings in science and other domains. And like all human understanding, even today it remains childlike and primitive when measured on an absolute scale. We acknowledge that our powers are finite and that we can never grasp the true nature of the cosmos. However, it is likely that we will carry our quest for understanding to the limits of our simple powers permit. Human curiosity will ever consider ignorance a vacuum to be filled and a darkness to be illuminated. And this will be just as true for religion as for mathematics, physics, and chemistry. In order to discuss religion objectively, let us confine the term to include those human institutions and beliefs which seek to understand and to guide the relationships between humanity and the infinite. All searchers for truth, including professed atheists and agnostics, can join freely in such a quest. 
The major religious bodies in today's world crystallized their beliefs and rituals long ago when human understanding was even more limited than the childish perceptions of reality we hold today. Yet, most of those religions gathered and nurtured ethical standards and rules of conduct which strengthened and sustained their adherence in the struggle for earthly survival. In the long course of history, the various religious traditions have accumulated many incidentals, some of which have outlived their usefulness. In the intellectual ferments of today, some of these unessentials are being questioned and discarded. All too often, the inappropriateness of insulary doctrines causes some people to discard all religion, leaving a painful void which cannot be filled by a substitute. Very often, religious leaders become excessively concerned with trivia and doctrine and ritual. Like the Pharisees of old, they fail to restate valid beliefs in harmony with evolving knowledge in secular fields. Because of this failure, religion has been subjected to much criticism and sometimes to ridicule. Unthinking belief has sometimes replaced judicious evaluation. In religious controversy, as in politics, fanaticism may displace reason, leading to vast human suffering. We forget that a complex subject can be viewed from many vantage points. This can lead observers to seemingly contradictory conclusions which can be reconciled by further study. The quest for truth is not for cowards. Treasured traditions and comfortable beliefs must not be permitted to overpower solid contrary evidence. Religious leaders should emulate their scientific contemporaries. Traditional understandings must be constantly revised and modified to incorporate new perspectives which appear as the total knowledge horizon of humanity is expanded through observation, experimentation, and reflection. Eternal and absolute truths undoubtedly exist, yet it is unlikely that human beings can ever totally and accurately encompass them with our limited and fallible understanding. Appropriate humility suggests that we regard all our knowledge as incomplete and tentative, ever subject to revision in the light of new information. Acceptance of this posture will eliminate most of the apparent conflicts between science and religion. Truth cannot conflict with truth. Christianity can exist in harmony with many elements of humanism, Confucianism, or pantheism. Our understanding of philosophy is childlike and limited. But not all philosophic questions are amenable to scientific analysis. There is a legitimate place for inspired teachings by religious leaders who may, through intuition or inspiration, perceive concepts which lie beyond the reach of human reason and scientific proof. So long as those teachings do not conflict with our reasoned judgments and so long as they contribute to human happiness, they can be accepted on faith which transcends reason. The ceremonials, vestments, and practices of ancient religions are not without value. They lend beauty and an appropriate aura of reverence to religious observances. The concept of prayer as a function of our nature can be accepted on faith. We may regard it as an effort to communicate in thought with the Supreme Being and with other non-physical beings, even including otherworldly projections of people now dead. The efficacy of prayer is not suitable for scientific study, Yet throughout history, notable human beings have often made prayer a part of their lives. Even in our modern and stylishly godless world, many leaders in the quest for scientific knowledge have gained through their observations of nature an abiding reverence for the majesty and mystery of God. They acknowledge many differences between their views and the teachings of specific religions, but they do not find those differences necessarily unreconcilable allowing for variables in viewpoint and levels of perceived certainty. We cannot scientifically prove the existence of a life after death. For many people, the concept represents a deep-seated hope for a continuation and perfection of our existence in another dimension, set in which the injustices and sufferings of this earthly life will be made right on the eternal scales of what we humans perceive as justice. Throughout our history, belief in an afterlife has been a source of solace and hope for many human minds. In considering these and other areas of controversy, we must not reject reason, even though we openly acknowledge its limitations. So long as we do not permit faith to override our rational powers, we should use those talents to explore the frontiers which lie at the outer limits of scientific observation. In death, we may reach final answers to these questions. 
it is possible that we may disappear into an eternal oblivion in which no answers are needed or sought. Those of us who attempt to accept and to follow the teachings of Jesus Christ take comfort in the promise of a better existence which is to come. On the outer perimeter of human understanding, there are no boundaries between fields of study. Modern physics has advanced our imagery of reality to a level indistinguishable from the spiritual. Enlightened religious leaders of tomorrow must maintain a reasonable understanding of human knowledge as it explores new areas. They must continuously redistill the beliefs and practices of their own special field of study to preserve and perfect the application of those enduring moral principles which can best guide humanity through the social hazards of the future. Today it is apparent that no religion has a monopoly on truth. It is also demonstrably true that the traditional teachings of most religions are grossly inaccurate in their views relating to cosmology and to the role and duration of human existence on the face of this planet. Acclaimed religious teachers did not profess to be expert in science. Their appeals were directed primarily to the moral sense of humanity. They often spoke in parables to express in simple language the ethical message of their mission. Their listeners were more often than not simple, unschooled people. Are we not all children of God? Physically, we are children as members of the community of living creatures, and we are children in a spiritual sense as well. Each of us is endowed with understanding and with a limited control over our own actions. We possess a simple ethical sense to permit a choice between good and evil, and our lives provide many opportunities to exercise that choice. We are aware of our good altruistic impulses, and we are equally aware of another aspect of our nature, which is selfish, destructive, and antisocial. We have survived as social creatures in a hazardous environment because our ethical nature has never been completely overwhelmed by evil. As our knowledge of physical reality increases, it will become more and more important that we permit our altruistic instincts to dominate our behavior. The survival of an age of reason will depend upon this change in our living patterns. We may review in this light the teachings of Christ as they apply to the nations of the earth today. Even those whose present philosophies and goals are in most direct opposition to his nonviolent message. Jesus Christ was an historical figure, although little is known about his humble life. It manifested mysteries which are not explainable scientifically. His coming was foretold by Jewish prophets centuries before his birth. They described certain details of his career and genealogy from which he would derive. Christ preached a message of love among mankind and between mankind and God. He referred to God in the anthropomorphic terms of his day. He spoke often of my Father in heaven. He spoke of himself as the Son of God as well as the Son of Man. He spoke of humanity as the children of God. He stressed spiritual values over material things and he was largely rejected by Jewish leaders because the Messiah they were expecting was to be a powerful, worldly figure who would free their people from oppression. Christ spoke of his kingdom as not of this world, yet promised to remain with his followers until the end of this world. He foretold a perfected kingdom of which there will be no end. Although he was a simple Jewish carpenter with little formal education, he revealed from an early age a profound new understanding of humanity. He remained a simple citizen until he was about 30 years of age. He then traveled about the countryside preaching to ordinary people his otherworldly thoughts. He foretold his own betrayal and execution, but predicted to his closest followers his early resurrection from death. He gained attention by performing miracles, but gained even greater loyalties by his penetrating understanding of the simple human beings who followed him. He foretold that his teachings would ultimately prevail. He could have avoided execution by the Romans, but freely accepted his death as a final fulfillment of the role he was to play on earth in some eternal divine plan. A few days after his death, he did reappear to his closest disciples in what must have been a profoundly inspirational manner. In the course of a few weeks, he was seen at close hand by large numbers of men and women who had known him personally. Most of those believers had been in hiding since his execution, fearful that they might be subjected to similar treatment. His presence inspired them in some mysterious way, wiping away their fears and instilling in them a fierce resolve to go out into the Roman world to spread the message he had taught in his brief three years of public life. Christ's appearance on earth 2,000 years ago did not take the form which had been anticipated. 
Perhaps his predicted second coming will be as different from our expectations today. He may be with us in a spiritual form even now as his teachings struggle to extend their permeation of our collective human awareness and subconscious. He did not see himself as the special prophet for a particular human group. He spoke in terms of universals and addressed all the nations of the earth. He advanced concepts which can appeal to all people of all faiths. Perhaps the second coming of Christ will take the form of a dawning of an age of collective human reason in which interhuman love and compassion will dominate our individual and national behavior. We know that humanity is a new and highly adaptable species. Judging by the records of other living things, our descendants should still be on earth several million years into the future. The cultural institutions and churches which accompany us today will undoubtedly undergo vast change in that long interval. It is to be hoped that the spiritual message of the great religions will continue to thrive and to increasingly dominate and inspire the lives of a perfected human family until the last person fades and dies on this remote planet.